So I went to see the Barbie movie a couple of weeks ago. Full disclosure, I let Karen see it first just to scope it out. But based on her recommendation and many others, I put on a pink shirt and went to see it. Not really. Didn't wear the pink shirt, but I, I couldn't resist wearing one today. So I went to see it, and I'm glad I did. It's clever, provocative, funny, and speaks to so many questions and issues people are grappling with today. And I'm not just talking about feminism and patriarchy and consumerism. I'm talking about things like identity and meaning and belonging. You probably know the basic storyline by now. The film opens in Barbie land, a sort of feminist utopia where Barbies rule the world and Kens roam the beach, trying to get the Barbies' attention. But when stereotypical Barbie begins to ponder her mortality, she finds herself thrust into the real world, where patriarchy rules the day and women feel left out, inferior, and unfulfilled. The rest of the film follows the Barbies and Kens as they struggle with themselves and each other to put things right, if they can figure out what right even looks like. Well, like I said, the film explores all kinds of cultural hot buttons, but it wasn't until the closing song that I realized what the film was really about at its core. As the final credits roll, Billie Eilish sings a song she wrote for the film entitled, What Was I Made For? The opening lyrics go like this. I used to float, now I just fall down. I used to know, but now I'm not sure what I was made for, what was I made for? I don't know how to feel, but someday I might, someday I might, what was I made for? Eilish says she wrote the song specifically for the movie, but after listening to it later, driving in the car, she realized she was singing and writing about herself, about her own search for identity and meaning in her place in the world. And that's when it occurred to me that America is having an identity crisis. Now, I don't mean America the nation is having an identity crisis, though certainly that could be argued. I mean Americans, men and women, young and old, are having an identity crisis. Like never before, people are struggling to figure out who they are and why they're here and where they belong. I found this definition of an identity crisis online. An identity crisis is a phase many people go through when they question and reassess who they are. A search for identity is common during the teenage years, but people may also reassess their lives after a major life event, such as retirement. Wait, what? <laughs> for all kinds of reasons, people seem to be wrestling with these questions today, reassessing who they are and finding their identity in a variety of things. Their politics, for example, or their gender, or their ethnicity, or their status, or their online profile, or their musical taste, or their ethnicity, or their sports allegiances, or their generation. These become the defining characteristic of their lives, the things by which they want to be known and valued and accepted. The question, how do you identify, has become a part of our everyday conversation. If someone asked you that question 10 years ago, you probably would have told them your name. When someone asks you that question today, you have to think about what they're actually asking and how you're going to answer. Psychologists tell us that identity has many aspects to it, including all the aspects we just mentioned. But at the heart of it, identity is about who I am and why I'm here and where I belong. The very questions that Barbie and Ken and Billy are asking. Now, the questions we all find ourselves asking from time to time, and not just in our teenage years or in retirement. Anytime we find ourselves in a new setting, facing a new beginning of any kind, we find ourselves asking again those foundational questions of identity and purpose and belonging. And I'm guessing that many of us are asking those questions here in the fall of 2023, 
As we begin a new season of school and work and church and life, who am I? Why am I here? Where do I belong? How will you answer those questions? One of the most popular shows on PBS these days is a series called Finding Your Roots, hosted by Henry Louis Gates, Jr. Each week, celebrities are given a chance to explore their genealogical history, who their ancestors were, where they came from, how they found their way to America, and even to the careers and, and, and the places they call home. And the guests are usually surprised by what they learn and find themselves thinking and feeling differently about themselves than they did before they had this information. Often they come away with a renewed sense of pride and purpose. But occasionally, what they learn leaves them feeling disoriented, or disappointed, or conflicted. There's more to our identity than where we come from, but surely our beginnings tell us something about who we are and why we're here and where we belong. So in this year of new beginnings for us as individuals and a church, we've decided to explore our roots as human beings and people of faith by returning to the biblical book of Genesis, a book of beginnings. Last week, we looked at the beginning of everything and learned that when God does a new thing, it's always purposeful, personal, and progressive. And we challenged ourselves to lean into the new things God is doing in our lives and our church. So as we think about who we want to be in the future, it seems wise to revisit our past, to remember where we came from and who we came from and what we were meant to be. So with that in mind, let's take another look at Genesis 1 and see what we can learn about the beginning of humankind. And once again, like we did last week, we'll eventually find our way to the New Testament in order to better understand where those beginnings were meant to take us and what they mean for us today. So let's begin in Genesis 1, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Uh, we're still in day six here, which began with the creation of the animals. But the text makes it clear here that something new is happening, something different from all that's happened before. Instead of saying, let there be, as he's done with the light and the land and everything else to this point, God says now, let us make. Now, not to suggest that God didn't make everything else, but this particular thing seems to require a particular word that describes direct personal action on God's part. God even talks to God's self. Let us make. Now, the us is certainly interesting. Last week, we made a big deal out of the fact that Genesis attributes all of this to one God rather than many gods, like other ancient creation stories. So who is God talking to here? Well, the most common and widely embraced idea is that this is a reference to the Trinity, to Father, Son, and Spirit. Uh, both Father and Son and Spirit show up here in Genesis with the Father speaking and the Spirit hovering. The Son isn't specifically mentioned here, but John 1.1 1, 1 in the New Testament tells us, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. So all three were involved in the work of creation. But some scholars, like John Walton, for instance, caution us against reading too much into that expression, let us make. Walton reminds us that, that these words were intended for a, a primitive audience. Long before the second and third persons of the Godhead had been named or embraced, 
He suggests that the original writers and hearers of this story of the word us would likely have had in mind a, a royal court of advisors. That would have been a familiar concept to them. Now, it's, it's, it's probably helpful to be reminded that these texts had to have made sense to the ancient audience. So we want to be careful not to read too much back into the story. But I also wouldn't want to dismiss the inspired dimension of these writings. Believing that the Spirit of God could have prompted a word choice that held even more meaning than the original author might have intended. How, however we take it, the plural language, let us make, emphasizes the intentionality of this act. There was a decision, even a communal decision, to bring something new into being, something different from all that had been created to this point. Let us make mankind, the text says. Now, it might just as well have been translated humankind, because the word suggests a plurality, and, and the rest of the verse makes clear that it's referring to both men and women. Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Now, scholars agree that the words image and likeness are synonyms, meant for emphasis, not distinction, as if they're two separate things. To, to the ancient hearers and readers, that word image would have brought to mind religious idols found in temples or statues placed by rulers in cities that belonged to them. In either case, the image didn't embody the essence of that idol or statue. The idol or statue wasn't actually the god or the king, but it did represent their presence and nature and activity. So volumes had been written about what this imago dei actually entails, but certainly it includes the capacities to reason and relate and reflect, to love and choose and pray. So, so, so while the man and woman are not gods themselves, the text is clear about that, they have the capacity to reflect God and be like God in many ways. And that sets them apart from everything else God has made to this point. Now that becomes even clearer when we jump ahead to chapter 2. If you ever spent any time in the early chapters of Genesis, you've probably noticed that chapter 2 reads quite differently than chapter 1. Now the simple explanation is that chapter 1 gives us a kind of wide-angle view on the creation of everything while chapter 2 zooms in on the creation of man and woman. It actually gets a bit more complicated than that, because the chronology of chapter 2 doesn't always follow the chronology of chapter 1, uh, which reminds us not to take too literal an approach to understanding these ancient texts. As we pointed out last week, these are stories, not science. Now, speaking of science, that group I mentioned last week, GC Science, is actually meeting on Zoom this Wednesday night to discuss the quest for the historical atom, which we'll also talk a little bit about next Sunday. So if you'd want to join, you can find out more at uh, g-science.org or under the Group Life tab on our Grace Chapel website. But let, let's jump ahead to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now, on the one hand, this, this close-up view makes clear that human beings are not divine. They're material beings made of the same earthly stuff that everything else is made of. The writer wants us to understand that creation is not an extension of God, as if God is in everything, as some religious systems suggest. But creation is an expression of God. It reflects God's nature, 
his personal, relational, and spiritual capacities. Human beings are not divine and were never intended to be. But this close-up also makes clear that human beings are different from anything else in creation. God clearly gives personal and intentional attention to the creation of the man and the woman, more so than, than anything else God created. The language suggests craftsmanship, like a potter forming a lump of clay into a beautiful and functional vessel. Then God personally and directly breathes into the human being, breathes God's life into the being, so that the man becomes not just something, but somebody. And now we're beginning to get to the roots of our identity as human beings. First of all, we are not mere animals. If you accept a purely naturalistic explanation for the origin of all things, leaving God out, then human beings are simply highly developed animals. Naked apes, one zoologist famously put it. Uh, the Genesis account makes clear that while we bear some physical similarities to the birds and the beasts, we are different from the animals and how we were formed, what we're capable of, and why we're here. Which leads to the second observation, we are not mere accidents. Again, if you accept a purely naturalistic explanation for the origin of things, then human beings, like everything else in the universe, are purely accidental. The random result of natural forces and elements that just happen to come together in just the right way, at just the right time, in just the right environment, to eventually become living, thinking, feeling beings. Now, that might make us happy accidents, but accidents nonetheless. No rhyme or reason to our presence on this earth, except what we might bring to it during our short stay here. I don't think that's the kind of origin story celebrities are hoping for when they go searching for their roots with Henry Louis Gates Jr. There's not a lot to get excited about if we're just highly evolved, happy accidents. But when we turn to the book of Genesis for our roots, we find we are not mere animals or accidents, but rather we are image bearers of the Most High God. We, we were uniquely designed and formed to express God's character and nature, His goodness and beauty and power and wisdom. And because of that, we're able to relate to God and each other personally in a way that nothing else in creation is able to do. The great Christian thinker of another generation, Francis Schaeffer, put it this way. The Christian knows that in the flow of history, mankind comes from a different origin. It's not that God has not made both man and the great machine of the universe, but that he has made man different from the rest of the universe. And that which differentiates man is that his basic relationship is upward rather than downward or horizontal. He is created to relate to God in a way that none of the other created beings are. Friends, every human being bears the image of God, no matter their age, ethnicity, gender, orientation, social status, physical ability, intellectual capacity, or religious belief. And every human being has a unique capacity to reflect God's glory to express his presence and nature and activity in a way no other human being can. That's where our identity begins. We are image bearers of the Most High God. That's something worth getting excited about. But it turns out there's even more to get excited about. Uh, let's go back to Genesis 1 and, and pick up the reading at verse 26. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. 
rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good, and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Notice that God blesses the man and woman. This is something that, that hasn't happened before. Clearly, there's something special about humankind in God's mind and heart. And part of that something special is that God intends for the human beings to share with him the work of creation, of filling the earth with goodness and beauty and life. Uh, the words rule over back in verse 26 and subdue here in verse 28 were words that were used to describe agents of a king or a governor. They convey authority and responsibility. <laughs> this is remarkable. In all the other ancient cosmologies, only the gods have jurisdiction over the earth. But here in Genesis, human beings are also given jurisdiction, what we sometimes call stewardship of the earth's resources and potential. It's especially interesting that God gives every seed-bearing plant for food for humankind. Because again, in most every other ancient cosmology, human beings are expected to feed the gods. The implication being that humans exist to work for the gods. In God's cosmology, it's God who feeds the human beings, who in turn work with God in carrying out his divine purposes. So when we return to our roots, we discover that we're not only image bearers of the Most High God, we are co-creators with the maker of heaven and earth. Collectively, we've been given authority and responsibility. And individually, we've been given abilities and resources to bring to fulfillment God's good vision for the world. When God tells the man and woman to be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, it's not just about procreation, giving birth to more humans. It's about co-creation, promoting human life and flourishing in all its forms across all the earth. Now, I, I know we've done a lot of theology here today and not a lot of application. Uh, there's a lot we could talk about if, if we had the time. We could talk about the dignity of all human beings. How every person we meet, every person on earth, is worthy of respect, safety, and the freedom to flourish simply because they are made in the image of God. We could talk about the sanctity of human life, every human life, regardless of physical and intellectual abilities, from the womb to the grave. We could talk about the spirituality of work. Whatever work you do in this world, whether you get paid for it or not, if it promotes human flourishing, is glorifying to God and good for the world. When, when you go to work tomorrow, you'll be fulfilling your divine purpose. We could talk about the stewardship of our planet. Creation care isn't just a political buzzword or, or an optional aspect of our discipleship. It's central to our life and faith as followers of Jesus. So we could talk at length about all these things from Genesis 1 and 2. But our, our focus here today is to speak to the matter of identity and purpose and belonging. And what we've learned so far is that unlike anything else in all creation, we are image bearers of God and co-creators with God. So when Billie Eilish asks, what was I made for? We have an answer. We were made in the image of God to fulfill the purpose of God, which is to fill the earth with goodness and beauty and life. If image bearer answers the who am I question, co-creator answers the why am I here question. 
When you put those two things together, we should feel pretty good about ourselves and our place in the world. So what's the problem? Why are so many people today searching for a sense of identity? And why are so many struggling with feelings of inferiority and worthlessness and despair? Well, spoiler alert, we know what's going to happen when we get to Genesis chapter 3. If Genesis 1 and 2 show us the world as it was meant to be, Genesis 3 tells us how it all fell apart. And we'll talk about that next week. But the end result is that the image of God in us was marred, almost beyond recognition. And the good work God created us to do became a source of frustration and conflict and pain. So much so that, that, that like Barbie visiting the real world, we're stunned and dismayed by the mess we've made of things and wonder how and if it can ever be put right. So this is where we need to fast forward a few thousand years to a moment when our Creator recognized the mess we had made and did something remarkable, something unheard of in any other cosmology or belief system, ancient or modern. The Creator became a creature. The second person of the Godhead put on flesh and blood and became one of us. The Gospel of John tells us that the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Jesus of Nazareth came into the world not only to show us how to live and work for God's glory, but to rescue us from the mess we'd made of things. And we'll talk more about how he did that in the weeks to come. But for now, hear these remarkable words from the New Testament book of Hebrews. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. Did you hear that? For surely it is not angels he helps. God never became an angel to share in their celestial activities or to rescue the ones who had fallen. And for that matter, God never became an animal to share in their earthly existence or to spare them from death. It's not angels or animals he helps, but human beings, fallen people like you and me even at the cost of his very life. If that doesn't give you a sense of worth and purpose, I don't know what will. But in case you're still not feeling it, let me take you back to a verse we looked at briefly last week, and then we'll try to bring this all together. Ephesians 1.4 tells us, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In other words, to become the image-bearing, co-creating beings we were made to be. But it doesn't stop there. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace. Did you catch that? In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship. It wasn't enough for us to be image bearers and co-creators, as remarkable as that is. God's intention from the beginning was that we would become sons and daughters, members of his eternal family. And don't get hung up on the predestined word, which has caused all manner of distress and distraction for people. The simple meaning of the word is that we were destined from before the creation of the world, predestined to be God's children. And everything I read in Scripture tells me that was and is God's desire for every human being. Some human beings choose not to be His children. And in love, 
God grants them that freedom. But God's intention, God's purpose in making us in the first place was that we would be his children and enjoy life in his universe with him and each other forever and ever. That's what we were made for. And God is so committed to accomplishing that purpose that he sent his son to suffer and die for all of our failures so that we might be forgiven and free to become the image bearers, co-creators, and sons and daughters we were always meant to be. Like I said, if that doesn't give you a sense of identity and purpose and belonging, I don't know what will. There's nothing wrong with finding meaning in your gender or ethnicity or musical taste or sports teams. But our identity begins here in relationship with the God who made you on purpose for a purpose. So what we're learning this week when it comes to our identity crisis is that you'll never know who you really are till you know the one who made you loves you, and calls you his child. Let me finish with a story. A few weeks ago, I had a chance to see a new show on Broadway entitled Pearly Victorious, starring Leslie Odom Jr. It's a revival of a play from the 60s written by Ozzie Davis. It's a dark comedy it tells the story of a black preacher in the Jim Crow South trying to buy his church back from a mean and miserly plantation owner. He, he comes up with an ill-advised scheme involving a hapless but likable young woman named Ludie Bell, who he found on a recent preaching tour. In one scene, Pearlie asks the young woman where she comes from. She says she doesn't really know who her parents are and tells how she'd been passed from house to house since she was a child, working in people's kitchens. But who cared for you, Pearlie asks. Who brought you up? Who raised you? Nobody in particular, Ludy Bell says. Just whoever happened to be in charge of the kitchen that day. Well, that explains the whole thing, Pearlie says. You missed the most important part of being somebody. I have? What part is that? Ludy Bell asks. Love, Pearlie answers. Being appreciated and sought out and looked after. Being fought over to the bitter end. Oh, I have missed that, Reverend Pearlie. I really have. And that's the most important part of being human. That's the source of our identity and meaning and belonging. It's being loved, being sought out and looked after and being fought over to the bitter end. And that's what God in Christ has done for every human being who's ever walked the earth from the beginning right up till today, from Adam and Eve to Pearlie and Ludie Bell to Billie Eilish and you and me. But so many people have missed it, or forgotten it, or walked away from it, and find themselves searching for identity and meaning and belonging. If you should ever find yourself wondering, who am I? Why am I here? Where do I belong? Remember your roots. Remember that you are an image bearer of the Most High God, and a co-creator with the Maker of heaven and earth. That's what you were made for. Even if you never acknowledge God, that's still who you are and why you're here. But the good news is that you were made for even more than that. You were made to be a son or daughter of a loving Heavenly Father, a member of His eternal family, through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. If you'd like to know more about what that means, how to become a child of God, we'd love to tell you more about it. Reach out to Pastor John or send me an email, brian with a y at grace.org. Because you'll never know who you really are till you know the one who made you, 
loves you and calls you his child. If you know that already, if you become a child of God through faith in Christ, then let it bring energy and joy and purpose to whatever new beginning you find yourself in today. Let's pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, great God, three in one, we praise and worship you today. King of the universe, maker of heaven and earth, giver and sustainer of life, Lord of the church, savior of our souls, friend of sinners. We praise you, Lord, for this world you have made in all of its beauty and wonder. We thank you for placing us here, made in your image, to join you in your good work. Forgive us, Lord, for the times this week we have fallen short of that glory. And for the mess we have sometimes made of our lives and our world. Thank you for this promise today that you know us, love us, and have come to be with us through your Son, Jesus Christ. That we can find forgiveness for our failures and freedom to follow you into new and better things. Pray for each one listening here today that they might find their way to you, the God who loves them and made them. In Jesus' name, amen.